Good evening, friends. Oh, it's so good to be back in Phoenix again. So glad to see two different warmnesses here. One of them, the warmness of the people, which is always the best. And I just come from where it's about ten below zero, so it's warm two ways. And I'm sure glad to be here tonight. I'm sorry that I wasn't here last night. Brother Jack's going to help me bear that. <laughs> I had a, a meeting uh, scheduled down in Shreveport, and we just couldn't drive it past. Uh, my old Ford just wouldn't make it. <laughs> so we, um, we was glad to get in this afternoon around about 2.30 and to be here tonight in this uh, lovely place, Madison Square Garden, with all you lovely people. And for this two weeks of service, oh, we're just going to have plenty of time to serve the Lord Jesus. And we're just so happy for this. And down here where it's nice weather, nice people, and a wonderful spirit here tonight, and everybody happy, why, the Lord Jesus can just do wonders for us, can't he? We're expecting him. And on the road down, we've been praying, and a few moments ago, I've been staying at a lovely home way back out here in, in West Phoenix, and I was out in a little patio this afternoon where the had me a place back there to stay, to study this afternoon, and oh, what a wonderful time. So I'm just sure that the Lord's going to bless us. And now we'll try not to keep you too long each night so that we can just uh, uh, get back the next night. I know many of you people work, and we respect that. And now for the first part of the week this week and part of the next week, as many sick folks here uh, understand, and we're going to try to pray for them. And maybe next week, if the Lord willing, we'd like to get in on some of the precious word to teach and to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and to see children born into the kingdom of God. I truly believe we're living in the last days. Just, and I am so happy today to know that we know the blessed Lord Jesus. The other day I was listening to a report on one of these outposts or wherever they watch the ground observers or they watch for airplanes. And this fellow said to me, he said, you know, Brother Branham said, we're not to tell people to get into their basements anymore or to get to a hiding place. He said, well, they got a bomb now that when it hits in a city, it'll blow a hole in the ground 175 feet deep. Uh, 15 miles square from, from either way it falls. 15 miles will blow a hole in the ground 175 feet deep. Then how far would it go beyond that? Well, I said, Brother, I'm so happy that I got a shelter that beat that all to pieces. <laughs> he said, Well, what would you ever find that would protect you from that? I said, It's uh, a shelter made out of feathers. He said, a what? I said, a shelter made out of feathers under his wings. <laughs> we will have died. <laughs> so that's the best protection I know of. Oh, what a day to live and an hour to preach the gospel. And the, well, just a wonderful time. Now, just before we turn into his word, let us bow our heads just a moment for prayer. <clears throat> our kind Heavenly Father... We come to Thee tonight with the simplicity of our hearts to pour out to You all that is within us. We adore You. We just couldn't live without You. We just love You. And You're just our life. And we pray tonight, Heavenly Father, that Thou in Thy great mercy will stretch forth Thy hand and touch every sinner in the building. And may when they leave tonight, may they not go from here sinners, disbelievers, but may they go rejoicing, happy, praising God. And we pray tonight that for every backslider that's in the building, that thou will put forth thy hand of mercy, carefully pick him up and lay him up on your shoulder, carrying safely back to the fold. And then, O oh God, as the disciples prayed once, just after Pentecost, the great persecution had set in, and they prayed and said, O oh Lord, stretch forth the hands of thy holy child, 
to heal the sick and the afflicted. And we would say that tonight, Lord, as we preach the word, stretch forth his hand and touch the sick and the afflicted. And may there not be a feeble one in our midst when we go out of here tonight. May everyone be healed. Grant it, Father. May the saints rejoice to see that in this great hour of trial that our God still lives and has the same power, the same authority, and has proven himself alive tonight. Grant these blessings. Bless the ministers, all these who are cooperating, all the ministers throughout this valley, everywhere. And just may we have a great gathering, Lord, just the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon the peoples in this valley and a great revival to prayer meetings will be behind cactus stalks and everywhere until Jesus comes. Grant it, Lord. Now, we pray for the people who let us have this place, and we pray that you'll bless them. And may we all together be thankful and give thee the praise. We ask that in the name of the Lord Jesus, thy Son, amen. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the Word of God. And as we see the day approaching as it is now, I am very happy to know that we still have the Bible, God's eternal blessed Word. And there's nothing will never take its place. There will never be a denomination or a church or never be a person or an individual will ever take the place of this written Word. Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Bible is just the prophets who, by a gift of knowledge, foresaw what God spoke before the foundation of the world. Think of how beautiful. Before the foundation of the world, God spoke these words. See, he was, he looked and as he seen the great uh, oncoming and he saw what had taken place. And now I said, in the beginning was the word. And before it could be a, a word, it had, what is a word? A word is a thought expressed. And God, in his mind, he was thinking just what would take place. And then, after he perceived it into his mind, and all was yet not official yet because it was in his mind, but when he once speaks it, he can never take it back. It's forever. It's part of him. And there's our confidence we have in him because that he cannot take his word back. We have to take ours back because we're human. We make all kinds of mistakes. But God can't take his back because he's God and he's infant. He knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. And when we look down upon these precious lines, how it thrills our heart to know that they're just for real. Just for real. Now, being we're going to pray for the sick in the manner that I pray for them, I want to read just a little portion of God's Word tonight out of the uh, 12th chapter of St. John and um, about the 30th verse and the 31st. And now I trust that God will add his... I beg your pardon. This is the uh, 20th verse, 21st verse. And may the Lord add his blessings as we read. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to the worship at the feast. And the same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethesda of Galilee, desiring, desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. I have just been notified this afternoon as I'm staying with some friends that you've had some great meetings here in Phoenix, that many great evangelists 
which passes through this lovely city. And by you being geographically just in the place you are, you are privileged people to hear these great evangelists that pass through here. And they come in a wonderful time while the winter seasons are on. Many tours are in. And you've had the privilege of sitting under the ministry of great man. And enjoy when you see the advertisement of uh, Brother So-and-so is coming to the city. How it makes you feel. And I know you rejoice. And I rejoice with you. But oh, I know that there's one that you would love to see above every one. That would be the Lord Jesus. Sirs, we would see Jesus. I don't believe that there's ever been a person who ever heard his sacred name mentioned through lips, but what that's been one of their heart's desires. We would see Jesus. I've often wondered what I would have done when I stood there that day and would have heard him say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I've wondered if I could live long enough to find the time that they could pick that word up by the radio waves because they say that, that your voice once speaks, it never dies in the earth. It's just like a little pebble thrown out into a lake. And those little waves carry on and on, and sometimes to the human eye can't see them no more. But yet, in the little vibration, it finally reaches the bank. And oh, how sweet it would be to hear the radio pick up the vibrations that's still in the earth from that word, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And by the way, if our voices carry on like that, then our own voices will be a witness to us at the day of the judgment. When the vibration of our voices is still going on, God will have the great microphone or the great crystal there that will pick up every vibration that we, and our own words will judge it. And then I know perhaps I'll never, may never live to see that day that when the radio can pick up that little vibration of his literal voice. But I have longed to live to see that day when I could hear him say this, it was well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. And if I could got a promise in God's Bible, if I can only live true to Him until that day, that's what He promised He would say. And oh, I look for that day. Well done, my good and faithful servant. <clears throat> I believe that we're living in one of the greatest hours for the gospel that has ever been on the earth. I believe this is the ripening time. One of the greatest times I wonder what would take place if St. Paul could stand on the streets of Phoenix tonight and see the things taking place that's taking place in the world. I'd imagine he would preach day and night, getting the word out for the time is at hand traveling around the world and the different nations and seeing their condition, there seems to be a great drama fixing to take place. And it looks like that everything's moving right into the, to the scene where God can just make that great thing come to life just at once. I want to say this tonight. 
that I believe with all that's within me that we are just fixing to have one of the greatest shakings that this world has ever witnessed of the gospel power being poured out. All heavens will turn loose after a while. And remember, at the same time, all hells will turn loose too. But oh, to make your choice tonight and put your anchor in the rock of ages, how beautiful it is to just set with that perfect assurance to know that all is well. And then at this great crucial hour that we are now approaching, where everything's taking place in the great scientific world, and they're trembling, and uh, know that we are living in the day that the gospel made many great promises for this day. Now, is those promises true? Or if they are true, then we should live by them. And if they're not true, we should get away from them and find out what is true. Now, this word is either the truth or it is not the truth. Now, the Bible teaches us here in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, that either is the truth or it is not the truth. Now, if he is the same, there's only one thing that would make him any different from what he was when he walked on the banks of Galilee. That is that he would not be in a corporal body. Now, that body has been lifted up and on the throne of God tonight. He that overcometh shall sit with me on my throne, as I have overcome and sat down on my Father's throne. And when he comes, he'll come like the light, coming from the east to the west. And every eye shall see him, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess when he comes. Coming down the road this afternoon when I got out of our eastern cloudy skies and was looking up into the bright blue. My little wife had went to sleep over at the side in the little truck. And as I looked up towards the skies and seen how blue it was, I looked back to Billy to see how far he was behind me. And as I looked back, I looked in the glass and seen a little bitty spot of blue in my eyes. I thought, wonder, God being so great, wonder if all the skies is just the blue of his eye. And that sun yonder that this little earth turns around is the sight that's in his eye just looking all over the earth. And that's just his eye. How great thou art, how great thou art. He can see. And I thought, oh, God, how wonderful you are. And then the Bible teaches that Jesus was here on earth and lived with us for 33 and a half years and ascended up. And after he, before he went up, he promised his disciples that he would Send the gospel to all the earth, and every creature should be a witness of it. Now he said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Now the Father that sent the Son went with the Son. He said, it's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Then if he was to be, if the church was to be sent in the same measure that God sent the Son and the Son sent the church, then the Father that went with the Son, the Son goes with the church. Amen. It has to be. 
As the Father has sent me to be a witness of Him, I'm sending you to be a witness of me, in other words. I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. What a marvelous thing. Now, that's either the truth or it isn't the truth. Now, Christ, I know the church fails and the church weaknesses, but Christ has no weakness. He cannot fail. He will always be Christ, the Son of God. The anointed, the Logos that went out of God, he'll always be there. And now, if he is so great as we've seen him in Galilee, as we've seen him through the Bible, as the pages unfold, and with these promises, I wonder tonight if we as his church wouldn't have just as much right as those Greeks did that come up to the worship to say, sirs. We would see Jesus. Now, there's some things in the Bible that God wants us to challenge. God is an all-powerful God. And He give His servants a commission to do great things. And we mustn't be afraid to ask God to do great things because he's asked us to do the impossible without him. So if he's asked us to do the impossible, we have to have the omnipotent God to do those impossible. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. These signs shall follow them that believe. The impossible with man. And we mustn't be afraid to ask God to keep His Word. Now, these Greeks had heard of Him. So, they come up to see Him. They wanted to understand who He was. They said, Sirs, we would see Jesus. Told Philip that. And Philip went and told Andrew. And finally, they got to the place where they could see Jesus. Now, I wonder that tonight in the, we realize this, and we're all aware of it, dear friends, that this world all over has the both pro and con. It has the real, genuine, sainted person of God, and it has people who try to impersonate saints. It has real, genuine neighbors. And it has some who try to impersonate neighbors. It has people who are real drivers of cars and some who try to think they're drivers of cars. And it's a pro and con. Now, there is tonight a real Lord Jesus Christ. That's just as true as this Bible is true. And now, if we'll just look into the Bible just for a few moments, and if these promises He made, if He'll keep those promises when the Word was written 2,000 years ago, and we see them tonight, those promises unfold before us, then there's nothing but to believe with all your heart that He is the risen Son of the living God. That He... Now, I've heard some great promises. I've heard of Buddha, Mohammed, and a lot of those founders of different religions. I've stood at the grave. But there never was one that ever raised up but the Lord Jesus. Now, when I was in India, they said, Oh, this one raised. That one raised. This is a virgin birth, and that a virgin birth. Oh, we, I said, you can't, you're trying to compare the ridiculous with the sublime. You can't prove that. I said, but I can prove to you that the Lord Jesus is raised from the dead and is alive right now. Sure. 
then should not we be the happiest people? No wonder we can feel the way we do tonight. No wonder our hearts can beat like a butterfly in there, Floppy. Because it's a truth. And I'm looking at my audience tonight, some young with their black hair and some old and gray. And it won't be long till the young will be old. It just doesn't take but just a few turns of the sun. And what is it? This life goes away just like a myth. Like a story that's told, says the Scripture. But then if, if we have the blessed promise that God will raise us up again and make us perfect, then what's the weary? Well, we should be happy above all things. Now, the only just way that we could do, if I could say this, if Jesus Christ, God's Son, will come to this building tonight and will prove to you that He is risen from the dead, that He is right here in Phoenix, Arizona and the Madison Square Garden building. What a challenge. Not, I don't mean something mentally worked up, some psychology. I mean the Lord Jesus in His Spirit. Now, he don't, won't come in his corporal body. If he does, it's all over. He might come in a corporal body before this meeting ends. If it does, praise be to God, we'll go in the rapture and we'll be with him. But he's never left us. He's here in the Spirit called the Holy Spirit. Now, when... He led the children of Israel. He was in a form of a light. All of you know that, a pillar of fire. When he come on earth, he was a man. Come down into flesh to take away sin. He said, I come from God and I go to God. He went to God. After his resurrection, there was a man who saw him. After his resurrection, after he had ascended on high, and his body had been taken back to God and was sitting on the throne, there was a man saw him. And I believe that's Acts about the 8th chapter, or ninth, somewhere along there. And that man's name was Paul. And he was on his road down to Damascus and a light, is that right? Struck him down right in the middle of the day. And he said, Who art thou? that I persecute. He said, it's Jesus. He was in spirit form. And that's the form he will be until he returns in his corporal body. He'll be in spirit form. A light. God is light. He was in the beginning. He's still a light. He was made flesh, went back to light. And will be light till he comes in the flesh. And when he comes again the second time in the flesh, then our bodies will be transformed and made like unto His, and we'll be with Him forever. What a beautiful, rejoicing thing that is. But now while He's here working with His church in the form of the Spirit, then if His Spirit is with us, He'll act just exactly like He acted when He was here on earth. It'll make you act the same way. Because it's not your spirit anymore. It's His Spirit in you. Christ's Spirit in you. The things that I do, He that believeth on me, St. John 14, 12. The works that I do, shall ye do also. See? We'll do the same works. Think the same thoughts. Live the same type of life. If the Spirit of God is in you, it makes you live like Christ, Christ-like. Then you become a written epistle, read of all men. Christ in you, reflecting His light out of you. As God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself and reflecting God from His own body. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten of the Father has declared Him. God it was in Christ. 
And what Christ's attitude was was God's attitude because the two were together. The spirit and flesh united together. Got a sermon on that, the dove and the lamb. We're going to get on it one night, one of these weeks. All right. Notice now. Now, when he came back on the day of Pentecost in spirit form to be with his church until the end of the world, not the end of the apostles, but the end of the world. And apostles, yes, I have to make that right and say true, because an apostle means one that's sent. And an apostle today, a modern apostle, is nothing in the world but a missionary. Now, if you tell me what the word missionary means, then tell me what apostle means. Apostle means one sent, and a missionary means one sent. It's the same thing. Apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists, those five ministering gifts are set in the church. Now, let's take the only just way that we could do this. If I'd say tonight to the Presbyterian, and uh, what do you think about this? Do you think that Jesus is the same yesterday and today? Yes, I do. Baptist, Methodist, and so forth. They'd all witness the same. Well, they say, our church teaches that. Our church believes that. That's true. I believe that, but with all my heart. I believe I just come from a meeting at Lyme, Ohio, sponsored by the Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian. And such a meeting, I, I tell you, the hundreds each night swarmed to the altar, weeping, seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, just recently, where Brother Moore and I was up here at Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I got a letter one day from a Lutheran dean that really tore me to pieces. He had 22 pages in it. And he said, the very idea, last night, I drove... He said, 15 miles, I believe, through a blinding snowstorm, thought I could hear a, a man of God. And what did I see but a polished up soothsayer? And just everything ridiculous. And said, the very idea, a man that preaches to the people that you do, and would say that the devil didn't have power to heal. And he just, oh, he just laid me out on him. Well, I thought that's, I love good criticism, if it's decent like that. So I turned around and answered his letter back. And he said, now, you was talking about you've been preaching for 25 years, said, I was preaching before you were born. And so I went ahead telling me all those things. Then that was all right. I wrote him a letter back, and I said, my dear beloved brother, I appreciate you, and you, I know that you must love me. If you don't love me, you love the Lord that I speak about. Because you're trying to correct me. If you didn't love me, you wouldn't try to correct me. And I believe that in your heart, you're trying to correct me. And now, if I'm wrong, then I wish to be corrected. I said, the first thing, you said the things that you seen last night was by the power of a soothsayer. I said, when Jesus Christ did the same things that you seen last night, they said he was Beelzebub. And Jesus said, you speak a word against me doing this. In other words, it'll be forgiven you. But when the Holy Spirit has come to do the same thing, Christ the same yesterday and forever, one word against it will never be forgiven in this world, the world to come. I said, now what if I was right? Remember, the Pharisees, many of those Pharisees and, and priests of that day had preached a lot longer than you have. And they were sages, but their eyes were actually blind to that, and they couldn't understand it. But I said, I want to ask you something, my dear brother. On your condemning me for saying the devil could heal, couldn't heal, the devil cannot heal. And I said, Jesus said he could not heal. And if Jesus said he could not heal, that settles it as far as I'm concerned, see? Jesus said, if Satan can cast out Satan, then his kingdom is divided, and he can't stand. Satan cannot cast out Satan. But here's what his reason he gave me. He said there was a, a woman lived in his town that had a, a spirit of evil, 
that the people come to her and she uh, plucks some of the blood out of her veins and pulls the hair out of their head or vice versa one and wound the blood and the hair together and walked down to the river behind her and throwed it over her shoulder. If she was constrained to look back, then the disease come back to the people. If, if she wasn't constrained to look back, they got well. And he said, 20% of those people are more get well. And then you tell me the devil can't heal. I said, I am, wrote and answered him, I said, I am certainly surprised that a Lutheran dean would base the theology up on an experience instead of the Word of God. <laughs> I said, God's Bible said he cannot heal. But I said, if you'll excuse me, I'll explain it. There's many people in the land today who say healers claim to be healers, claim to have power to heal, and people go and get healed. Sure, but I said, I've seen witch doctors in Africa. People go to idols and get healed. Over in France, there's an idol setting up that people go by, goes for that idol, and the doctors go by and look at the people as they go by, and they get healed. That wooden or stone idol doesn't heal them. Neither does the witch doctor heal them. Neither does the divine healer heal them. Those people think they are approaching God. And upon the basis of not your salvation, but on the basis of your faith, God has to honor that faith. Certainly he does. It's the faith that heals them. Never no man has power to heal. God alone can heal. And I say this in the face of the people there is no other healing in the world but divine healing. You cannot make out any other kind of healing but divine healing. If I broke my arm out here cranking my car and run into the doctor and said, Doctor, heal my arm right quick. I didn't get my car started. I want to finish my car. Well, he'd say, you need mental healing. Well, he can set the arm, but God does the healing. If you've got an appendix and the doctor cuts it out, he doesn't heal. He just moves the obstruction. God heals. See, there never was a hospital, a doctor, a medicine, or anything else ever done any healing. God's Word doesn't lie. I'm the Lord who heals all your diseases. Certainly. See, God's alone in creation. The devil can't create. If you say the devil can heal, then you make him a creator. Then he's co-equal with God. Only God alone can create. The devil can only pervert what's already created. What is unrighteousness? Is righteousness perverted? You get it? Righteousness perverted. It's right for a man to live, take his wife and be a husband and wife, to live that way. But with some other woman who could do the same act, it would be righteousness perverted, which would be sin. And everything the devil can do is to pervert what God has created. You get it? So God alone can develop cells that can heal. And He's the only healer, for He's the only creator. God alone is the healer. That Lutheran man called Brother Moore and I to the college, wanted a little interview. We didn't know what he was going to say, but when we got up there... They had a great dinner set for us across the big gym. And this, after eating dinner, he screwed his plate back. He said, Brother Branham, I want to ask you a question. I said, what is it? He said, I've seen all kinds of going on, but I want to ask you, is there really something besides accepting Christ by faith and believing? Is there such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Ghost? I said, yes, sir. He said, what more can a man do but just believe God? God? Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. I said, that's what Abraham could do. But God, to recognize his righteousness, gave him the seal of circumcision as a recognition of his faith. And I said, we believe God raised up Christ and accepted him as our personal Savior. And then when God recognizes that faith, he gives us the seal of the Holy Ghost. That he's recognized our faith in the resurrected Son of God. He said, that's what we want in this seminary. College. 
I looked down that long line of students, and I said, well, what will the Lutheran church say? I said, we don't care what the Lutheran church wants. We want God. And I said, do you mean that you want to receive the Holy Ghost? I said, how do you do it, Brother Random? I said, scoot your plates back and kneel alongside the wall. And 71 students and the dean and all received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and they're having signs, wonders, and miracles. What's his name, Brother Moore? Edry? Brother Edry, the dean of the college. I was up there a few days ago, and they're having signs and wonders and healings and going on. Now he's getting a, a group set when to come back from Canada this trip to come by and just have two days solid meeting with just deans of Lutheran colleges. Oh, brother, Pentecost is not a denomination. It's an experience that belongs to everybody. It's what we need. And Pentecost is nothing but the vindication of a resurrected Lord Jesus, which is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what it is. I know it's been misused, it's been misconstrued, and so forth, and impersonated, but that only shows out the real Christ much better to me. If you see a bogus dollar, it means there's a real dollar. Now, notice, now when Jesus was here on earth, if we want to find out what he was and see if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, when he was here on earth, did he claim to be a healer? No, sir. No. He said, it's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Is that right? And then he said, verily, verily, St. John 5, 19, verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself. But what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. How many ever read that? St. John 5, 19. Then Jesus, who could not lie, being God incarnate here on earth, he could not lie, and he said that he did nothing until God who was in him showed him first what to do. Now that's either the truth or it isn't the truth. I believe it's the truth. Verily, verily, I say to you, St. John five nineteen, the Son can do nothing in himself. He's talking to the man. But what I see not what I hear, what I see the Father doing. That doeth the Son likewise. Notice. Now let's go back and find out what He did. And then if we can find out what He did, and then He'll do this coming two weeks in here in this building, what He did then, oh, we should be the happiest people on all the earth. Because that he who gave us the promise of eternal life is alive and with us tonight to confirm that promise. What a wonderful thing. Let's follow him just for a moment now. And then tomorrow night we pick it up from a, a, a different place. Let's follow him for a moment. Let's take St. John's Gospel, the first chapter, and begin with it. And then tomorrow night maybe we'll go to another uh, part in the Bible. Let's take St. John first to begin. When he came on earth, we know his birth story, how he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and the, uh, Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, and that first little form of life, blood cell, was brought into Mary without any, uh, any earthly person having anything to do with it. And the cells began to develop, and he was born, the angels sang, and so forth, and we have no record of his ministry from 12 on till about 30. Then when he appeared on the earth in his ministry again, we find him being baptized by John the Baptist and into the wilderness for 40 days for temptation. Out of the wilderness he came, and immediately he began praying for the sick. Now let's see if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and then ask the question, we would see Jesus. I'm going to give about 10 minutes here just to the Scripture, and you follow the Scripture, then see if the Spirit follows the Scripture. If any spirit doesn't follow the Scripture, it's a wrong spirit. That's right. If it goes beyond this Bible, it's a wrong spirit. If it doesn't get to it, it's a wrong spirit. See, if the devil can't keep you from seeing a truth, he'll push you overboard with it, you see. That's his business, see. If he'll go off onto some fantastic, or either he'll keep you from seeing it at all. 
But to stay right straight on Calvary, it'll always come right back to the Word every time. It's the Word. Now we're at St. John, the first chapter. We find out down there that there was a man got saved by the name of Philip, and he goes over to find his friend Nathaniel. And when he found Nathaniel, he was under a tree praying. He said, Come see who we have found, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And this righteous man, gun barrel straight, stood up and said, Could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? It was a wicked city. And I think Nathaniel gave him the best answer, or Philip, rather, gave him the best answer that anyone could receive. said, Come and see. Come and see for yourself. Ah, oh, look, if we could have a sermon right there. Oh, to that man that doesn't have the audacity to come and see for himself, but to stand on a sideline outside and criticize. How do you know? Old Dr. Davis that ordained me in the Missionary Baptist Church. One night in a debate, there was an infidel. He was debating with the infidel. And there was an old boy stood in the back of the building. He'd come up, had a hair hanging down his neck, carving on an apple. And the infidel said, what do you want? He said, I want to ask you a question. So what is it? He said, is this apple sweet or sour? He's eating it. He said, I don't know. I'm not eating it. He said, that's just what I thought. And went back and sat down. That settled it. <laughs> How do you know unless you taste and see? The Bible said, or the poet said, taste and see the Lord is good. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after Him. Not those who stand back and criticize. A few days ago, I read an article in McCall's Magazine and how it was criticizing some of the men on the field praying for the sick. And I was in the city where this editor lived. And I said, these men might deserve some of that criticism, especially on the money and so forth. They might deserve it. I'm ashamed to say it, but they probably do. I'm not the boss. But I said, I'd like to ask this to that editor. If these men in their mistakes are trying to get something done for God, what's he doing for the kingdom of God? And then when I noticed his article... That he said, A.A. A. Allen wrote that book at, uh, on the biting devil or so forth. And Allen never wrote that book, Brother Allen never. And if he never checked his articles no better than that, I wonder if half of it's authentic. That's right. If it wasn't checked no more closer than that. But if somebody is trying to do something and yet making blunders and you're doing nothing, then keep still. The best thing. They're getting souls saved anyhow. So what they doing? Working against it. I'd rather be found making a mistake than trying on the sideline criticizing those who are trying to do something anyhow. Certainly will. All right. Philip said, come and see. That's a good thing. Come find out. Then pass your opinion. And as he come up into the line where Jesus was praying for the sick, as he always was, or wherever he went, the people brought to him the sick and afflicted. And Jesus turns and looks that staunch Jew in the face and said, Behold an Israelite. Now, he could have been a Greek or anything. They all dressed alike, beards and turbans. said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. It astonished him. said, Rabbi, when did you know me? And Jesus looked straight into his face and said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. Thirty miles around the mountain. What eyes? That was Jesus yesterday. If he is the same today, he does the same today. Is that right? 
Now notice, what did this man say upon whom the miracle was performed? You say a miracle? Certainly was a miracle. Anything that's supernatural is a miracle. He said, Rabbi, now this is a Jew now, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. And he said, Because I said this to you, thou believest, thou shalt see greater things than this. But now the Jew turned and said, He's Beelzebub, the chief fortune teller. And he told them if they spoke that against him, it would be forgiven. But when the Holy Ghost comes to do the same thing, to speak against that would never be forgiven. Now, let's follow him on. Peter came to him. And you know what? He knew that man's name and knew who his daddy was. He said, your name's Simon. You're the son of Jonas. That kind of startled him. That was Jesus yesterday. Now we find out that a little woman had a blood issue. And she pressed through a crowd to touch the border of his garment. And now the Palestinian garment has an underneath garment because of dust getting on the legs. And then a robe that went over that. And Jesus thronged with the people pressing him. And that little woman touching his garment, she touched your coat. You never feel it physically. And she turned and went out into the audience. And Jesus stopped them all and said, Who touched me? Someone touched me. And Peter withstood him and said, Well, all, everybody's touching him. And why sayest thou who touched me? He said, But I perceive that I have gotten weak. Virtues went from me. It was a different kind of touch. Now there is, oh, don't miss this. That's where this educated, high-headed world today is a missing it. They're putting their name on church books, but failing to touch with the feeling. See? And he turned, and he said, the whole multitude's touched you. And he looked at every one of them, denied it. But he was endued with the power. God was in him. And if all that God was, was poured out into Christ. And all that Christ was, was poured into the church by the Holy Ghost. Then the Bible said, New Testament, Hebrews, that he still tonight, here it is, he is a high priest. That can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. You can still touch him. And he looked around until he found the woman. Then he revealed it to her. She could not be hid. And she come and fell down. He said, daughter, thy faith. No vision of his. She touched it. That was her vision. That was her faith. Daughter, thy faith has saved thee. Notice, there was something about him that knows she was healed. He pronounced her healed. Thy faith has saved thee. Now, that woman could have died a year later with the same disease, but she was healed then. The doctor can come and give you, you can be having pneumonia out in the hospital. He can come put you in an oxygen tent and give you penicillin, and you can be perfectly well. Pronounce you well, go on home next week, work for a month. And the next month, die with pneumonia again. But you were healed the first place. Right, see. see. Now, I want to ask you something. That was Jesus yesterday. If he is the same today, he does the same thing. He's the same high priest. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'll be with you to the end of the world. Now watch him. And he, in St. John 4, we take now. In St. John 4, he went up to Bethesda. Now, I beg your pardon. He was, uh, went up to uh, Samaria. He was on his road down to Jericho, which is just below Jerusalem. But he went up over the mountain to, to uh, Samaria. And when he went to the Samaritan, the Samarian, rather, he sent his disciples into the city to buy some victuals. 
And while he was gone, a woman came out, a woman of ill fame. She had five husbands. Now, the Eastern view said she, did, she was of ill fame, but our Bible said she had five husbands, and the one she's living with then, she's living with a man not married to him, well, then it was ill fame to me. Now, she came out to get some water, and as she let down the window into the uh, place to get the water, she brought it up, and many of you in the Orient know they pack it on their head and on their hip. And as she brought the water up, perhaps a beautiful woman set it on, started to set it on her head, and she looked over there in the corner of a little panoramic, and there sat a middle-aged Jew. Now, the Bible said, of course, we know he's only 30-something years old, but he looked to be 50. They said in St. John, the sixth chapter, Thou art a man not yet 50. See, his work had drug him down, so physically speaking. Not yet 50. And say, you've seen Abraham? He said, before Abraham was, I am. See? Now, he looked, might have looked 50, but he was sitting back in this place. And when he said to her, Woman, bring me a drink. And she said, Why, well, you're a Jew. There was a law of segregation. Said, you have no, no, we have no dealings with each other. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. What was he doing? Contacting her spirit. Here's the gospel coming to Samaria. Now, notice he never done any miracles there. He left that for Philip. When Philip went down, he knew there'd be a revival, but he talked to him. He laid the word down. But notice, he, when he did this, the woman said, Why, we worship in this mountain, and you say in Jerusalem, and the conversation went on until he found exactly what that woman's trouble was. And when he found her trouble, he said, Go get your husband. She said, I have none. He said, That's right. You've got five, and the one you have now is not your husband. And thou said as well. Now watch what she said. This is Samaritan now. What did the Jew say when he did that to the Jew? Why, he said, you're the son of God, the king of Israel. What about Samaria now? What did she say? Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. We know, we Samaritans, we know that when the Messiah cometh, which is called the Christ, when Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things, all things. But she couldn't understand who he was. He said, I'm he that speaks to you. Now watch. And on that she ran into the city and said, Come see a man that told me what I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? Now if that was the sign of the Messiah then, and he's the same today in the Spirit of the Holy Ghost, he'll do the same thing because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't this the Messiah? Now, one more statement. Isn't this the Messiah? And they come, heard him speak. Now, that's what the Samaritan thought. That's what the Jew thought was the sign of the, of the Messiah. And at the pool of Bethesda, when he had healed a man, looked all around and found a certain man, said, Will thou be made well? Left the multitude of afflicted, healed that man, and made him well, put him on his bed on his back and went away. And they found him. And they questioned him, and he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. Now, notice that if he has raised from the dead, and we who are struggling and trying and putting forth every effort, every one of you from different churches, whether you're Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, or Nazarene, Pilgrim Holiness, if you are putting forth your best with all that you know how to love and to serve the Lord Jesus, He's obligated to His Word to manifest Himself to you. He's obligated to do it. If he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, then the only way that we would know that he is alive, first, now remember, 
Now you can say, oh, I feel him in my heart. That's fine here in America, but that won't work overseas. The Mohammed said, I feel Mohammed. The Buddha says, I feel Buddha. We can produce just as much psychology as you can. Certainly can. They can work themselves up into such a frantic, they can take a lance. I've seen one at Zurich, Switzerland not long ago. Well, I never looked at it. But he stood right there and took a saber and pushed it to his body over his heart and put, let a doctor come there and pour water in it, run out on the other side. Pull it back out, walk off the platform laughing. See? A Mohammed. I've seen him at the, what they call the Feast of the Prophets, take a sword or lance and stick it through their chin and just screaming and going on until they go up through their nose and come up into their forehead and drop it down like that and never bleed a drop under such excitement. But when it comes, there's no such a thing as that in the Bible. That's the fantastic. That's, a, that's something else. That's just the psychology. But Christ, who raised from the dead, acts according to the way He did in the Bible. See? So those religions can produce psychology, but they can't produce the resurrection. And Christianity is the only religion out of the hundreds that there is under the sun this day can only one that can produce the evidence that Jesus Christ has raised from the dead. Sirs, we would see Jesus. I want to see Him. I love... There's never want to have a meeting. But my heart rejoices when I know that His great presence is near. And a watching movie. Something just takes wings within me. My soul lifts up into an atmosphere that you can't explain. I've seen it set congregations electrified. A few nights ago amongst hundreds, yes, thousands of Lutherans and Presbyterians together, they rolled an old woman to the platform in a wheelchair. And when the Holy Spirit began to reveal and to tell her, who she was and where she come from and what was wrong. And then the old woman nodded her head. That was truth. Told her what church she went to, how they'd moved her in and out of Sunday school for so long. All those saints, yes, that's right. Started to pray for the old thing and looked coming down across to the top of the building. There come that old woman walking down to the vision. Oh, all devils out of hell could never touch it then. It was a finished work. God had showed what was going to take place. Oh, my heart thrilled. I said, you Lutheran brethren, and to the rest of you that's accepted the Lord Jesus, you that are afraid and was afraid of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, watch the power of Almighty God. Watch what takes place with this woman. And standing there, I said, sister, in the name of the Lord Jesus, rise up from that chair for your faith has done something. I saw a vision of you coming this way, rejoicing with your hands up in the air. And there's been in that wheelchair for I don't know how long they picked her up by the hands and off the platform and down to the audience. She went rejoicing. Christ lives. Sirs, we would see Jesus. Let us pray. Almighty God, the Creator of heavens and earth, who loves us with such undying love, until you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but would have eternal life. And oh God, may His presence appear here tonight in His church among the believers. There, if by chance might be an unbeliever sitting near, may they then see the infallible proofs of the resurrected Christ. And when they go home tonight, May they be like those who come from Emmaus. On that first Easter morning, when the lilies was all blooming, 
and the fragrance of the roses in the air on that first Easter morning as Cleopius and his friend walked down the road discouraged as the whole world seems to be walking tonight. Oh, God! Someone appeared and began to speak on the Word how that the Bible must be fulfilled. And, oh, Holy Spirit, I pray tonight that you will take this Word and will fulfill it this night in the eyes and ears and hearts of this waiting audience. And when once you got them inside and shut the doors, you did something just like you did before your crucifixion, and they recognized it was you. Then away they went, rejoicing, saying, Truly the Lord has risen. And may we tonight as we leave here, may you do something tonight here just like you did before your crucifixion, that this audience might know that their faith is not in vain in the Lord. They're trusting, and may the resurrected Christ do the same things that He promised that He would do and did do before He was crucified, and He promised that His church would continue the same works until He comes. May it be so for God's Word and the glory of Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I promised you to be early, and I'm so sorry. But I tell you, if you were standing here and feeling this wonderful, wonderful spirit. I've been with you Phoenix people many times, and we've had wonderful meetings. But I say this. I just trust that this will be the same anointing every night while we're here. Oh, it's marvelous. This looks like it, everybody's under expectations and something's fixing to happen. Now may he bless. Now I want this to be thoroughly understood that I say this from my heart. I am not a healer. Anyone knows that, don't you? I, I have no, no thing, nothing at all to heal people with. There's no one else in the world is a healer. There's no medicine in the world that will heal. There's medicine that will keep clean while God heals. There's medicine that will kill infections. There's doctors who can set bones or remove pieces that's dead in the body, but they don't claim to heal. Doctors don't claim to be healers. Not at all. Well, you say, what about when you got pneumonia and they give you penicillin? Well, that's like putting rat poison out. It just poisons the rats that's in you. That, uh, it can't heal up the tissues that's been torn down. Certainly not. God has to do that create those blood cells and so forth. Only God can heal. Now, in order to get keep the people lined up, how many in here wants to be prayed for? Raise your hands up. Everywhere you're at. I don't care where you're at. Just raise your hand. All right. Everywhere. Now, if you believe, now, cut off all your outside world now, and if you believe that Jesus Christ, God's Son, is a living tonight, not up in heaven, but here, in you, in me, in his church, trying to work his way out to unbelievers through us. If you believe that with all your heart and accept it in the same way, I believe Christ will appear here and will heal the sick. Now let's call some of the prayer cards. How many did you get out of Fifty? hundred? All right. All right, number one, stand up over here if you can. If you can't, raise your hand. Prayer card number one. We'll just have to line them up. Look at your prayer cards and see who's got it. You have prayer card number one, woman. All right, right here, lady, if you will. Number two. Number two. Number three. Raise up your hand, if you will, just as I call, if you got. Number three. Would you raise your hand? Every who has prayer card three. I'm sorry, sister. Three. Four. All right, sir. Five. Five. You, sir. All right. Six. Who has prayer card six? Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. 
living. They're forming a line, so 11, 12. Would you raise your hand if has prayer card 12? The little lady with the shawl. Do you have a 12 there, sister? Your prayer, 12. Oh, you just go. 12, prayer card 12. Look, it may be, if you've got a prayer card, sir, it's not 12, is it? No. All right. The lady on the stretcher, you have no prayer card? No. All right. You don't have to have. That's all right. All right. 12, 13, 14. That must be wrong. All right. All right. That's just all right. That'll be okay then. All right. We'll start with them right there then. All right. Well, maybe, maybe they've stepped out. And maybe we can call them back just in a few minutes. All right. Now, let's. Now, I'm going to ask all you little fellows, and if you will, will you help, will you help the Lord Jesus tonight? Will you help me? Will all you church pl- just try to keep just as reverent as you can for a few moments? And ever who's operating this speaker, if you'll speak it up just a little bit. And now let's be real reverent just for a few moments now, and let's see if our Lord Jesus will come. Would it be wonderful to see him move right down into this audience? Now, how many here doesn't have prayer cards? And yet you want God to heal you. Raise up your hand. Oh, it's just everywhere. Now, I tell you what. If he's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, you look this way and believe. How would you ever know that he touched you if there wasn't some way for him to vindicate it back? Is that right? Now, what is the Spirit of God? It's something that lives in you. It moves through you. Now... What did Jesus say? Ye, I am the what? Vine. Ye are the what? The vine doesn't bear fruit, does it? No, sir. What bears fruit? Our branches. When he was here, he was a branch too. From God. God was in him. But now, God's in us. And he's the vine. And we're, what does the vine do? It furnishes energy to the branches. Is that right? And the branches bears the fruit. Then his hands, our hands are his hands. Our eyes are his eyes. Our life is his life. He puts his life in us. We live the life that he would live if he was here on earth. In a physical form. While the body is sitting at the right hand of God, making intercessions for us all the time. Oh, isn't that beautiful? That just knocks all the kinks out of unbelief to me. Your face is so real. Now, now look. I, let me let's see, Brother Moore, if you will. Now, back into the line there. We're, are we strangers, all, all of us strangers? How many of you know that I don't know you know nothing about you? Let's see your hands go up everywhere, right around in the lines. There. But there's somebody here that does. Now, if God in heaven will manifest itself the same way... Is this a woman for the first one? Come here, lady. Here's a woman. As far as I know, I know nothing of that woman. She just raised her hand that I didn't know her. I've never seen her in my life, as far as I know. She's a perfect stranger. She's standing here. She could be an infidel. She could be a critic. She could be a Christian. She, I, I don't know. She could have something wrong with her. Maybe she's standing here for something else. She might be standing for someone else. She might be standing for herself. She might be sick. She may be... Uh, I don't know what she is. I couldn't tell you. Now, here's the position. Now, if Christ was standing here... Now, if the woman is sick, I don't know. If the woman is sick, if she and Christ were standing here, she could look at him in his corporal body, and she could look at him, and she'd say, Lord Jesus, I'm sick. Will you heal me? Now, he can't go beyond his word. Is that right? So the only thing he could do would refer back to his word and say, I did that 1,900 years ago. Is that right? Now, if you were staying here and you was a sinner, what if a woman's a sinner? And she's come up here to say, Lord Jesus, I want, I want you to save me. Will you save me tonight? What would he say? He can't go beyond his word. I did that when I said it's finished at Calvary. Do you believe that? Yes, I believe it. Then 
As thou hast believed, so be it to you. Is that right? Everything of God, I just think of this, everything of God is a finished work. It's finished, everything. Healing, salvation, everything's a finished work. It's unfinished. Now, the only thing it is, is our personal faith in that finished work. If that ain't the scripture, I, I don't know it. <laughs> That's of our personal faith in a finished work. Now, we draw the remuneration of, our, of, his, of his death at Calvary by our personal faith in what he died for. He is wounded for our transgressions with his stripes to heal. Now, God, first, he told that in the Bible. That should settle it forever. But not with God. He said he put some in the church, prophets, some with gifts and so forth, to, to bring the church together, to perfect the church, and to keep you in harmony and loving one another and moving on with faith, knowing that he's raised from the dead. He'd do the same thing to his church that he did then. Then he's obligated to that word. Is that right? Now, if Christ was standing here talking to her, let's take this. Here's the picture. Take it like this. Just a moment. Here, here's a picture again of, of Samaria. Here's the man and the woman. Now, here's our first time meeting. Here she is. I don't know her. She doesn't know me. And if she was born in Phoenix and me in Kentucky, we were born miles apart. And here we are first time to meet. Now, let's take this picture now. Now, Jesus was sitting there, and he walked over to the, uh, sat down at the well, and the woman walked over and got the water, and he went to talking to her. And as he talked to her, he caught her spirit. And he said, found out what her trouble was. He said, her trouble was adultery, so he said, go get your husband. She said, I have none. He said, that's right, she got five. She recognized it to be the sign of the Messiah. Did she, here's what she said. We know, we Samaritans, we know that when the Messiah cometh, he does these things. How many knows the Bible says that? Let's see your hand. Well, then, if he's the same yesterday and forever, do you believe as much as the Samaritans did? Sure. Then if he's raised from the dead, he would know what this woman was for. Now, just a moment for prayer. Heavenly Father, now I've spoke of your word at length, this lovely meeting tonight. May this be Phoenix's great visitation. May there be some of the greatest things that's ever been done on the face of the earth manifested here in Phoenix. Grant it, Lord. And I pray that just tonight that the Holy Spirit, we realize that man can't do this. It's not in man to do it. But I pray that the Holy Spirit will come and will make himself known that the people may know that Christ lives tonight. And, oh, God, this audience and myself, we yield ourselves, every believer, to you, that you would work through us and in us to manifest your love to us. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, the only thing I want you to do is answer me as I speak to you. Now, you're the first person to be on the platform just to get the anointing started, the anointing rather started, and then it'll start moving in the audience. Just so you can touch him there, wherever it is, as soon as you see, if you see it going to work. Now, this woman here who doesn't know me and I don't know her, I don't know whether you do or not, all right? But if the Holy Spirit will come and do the same thing that the Lord Jesus would do if he is standing here, and you know, I don't even have a grammar school education, and there's nothing that I could do and if some of the rest of you would like to come take my place, you're welcome. You're just welcome to do it. See? But there's a very silent audience. See? But you see, it's no one can do this but the Holy Spirit. Now, if there be a skeptic or unbeliever sitting close, now you'd say, well, it's done, but it's through another power. Then that's just what you'd receive. That, that, see? Pharisees said the same. So that's Beelzebub, and they're in hell tonight. See? Nathaniel said, Thou art the Son of God. He's in glory tonight. It just depends on what you class it. You have to know it was supernatural. Now, as uh, talking to the lady and looking at her, just as the brother... Now, of course, she's wearing glasses. Anyone sees that? If I'd say this man here is uh, crippled, I guess he is. He's sitting in a wheelchair. And this woman 
maybe paralyzed or what, I don't know. She's laying in a stretcher. Uh, that You'd say, sure, anybody can see that. This woman's got on glasses. Of course, she's got bad eyes, or either she's past 40 years old and has to use glasses to read by. If you pass 40, why, your eyeballs actually get flat. So you have to use reading glasses. So, but I don't know her. But now if the Holy Spirit will move and proclaim Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, lady, if there was one thing that I could do to help you, I'd do it. If it was financial troubles and I had some money, I'd let you have it. If it was domestic troubles and I could talk to your husband, or if you are married, I'd, I'd do everything I could. Now, if it's for healing, there's only one thing I could do, pray for you. But now the Holy Spirit can go beyond my boundaries. See? The Holy Spirit can let you know whether his, what His attitude is towards you. He can let me know what you're here for or something or, or what you've done or, or who you are or something on that note. Is that right? All right. And if He will, will you believe Him? Will the audience believe with all your heart? Now, just look this way in the Bible. It said, look on us. Peter, John said, look on us. And Elijah said, if it wasn't, I respect the presence of Jehoshaphat because I wouldn't even look at you. See, it's something that attracts your attention because these others in here at spring are all spirits. Certainly. And many sick. But you are here for sickness. And you are a Christian. That's right, a born-again Christian. And I see you going from me years back. And you're suffering with some sort of a nervous condition causing you to have headaches. And that's at least been five or six years back you've had those. And you've got some kind of a trouble in your back. You've got back trouble, and something under the right side, it's a gallbladder trouble. And I see you somewhere standing and someone praying for you. You're very low, very sick with something. Why, well, it was me. And you had cancer. And you were healed with cancer. When I was praying for you, that's, thus saith the Lord. That's true, isn't it? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we approach Thee in that marvelous, wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. And with hands laid upon this woman, deliver her, Lord, from all her afflictions and sicknesses. May she be made well from this night henceforth. Amen. God bless you, sister. Have faith, believe with all your heart. We are strangers to each other, I suppose. Be real reverent. Just a moment. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Now, if the Lord Jesus will let me know what you're here for, Will you believe Him with all your heart? You will accept it? Just a moment. Little lady sitting there praying and weeping with a little red coat on, sitting there with your hands up over you. Don't weep no more. You've been having spells of passing out, collapsing like. That's right. Raise up your hands. That's right. That's over now. She touched something. She's 30 feet from me. Is that right? What did she touch? The high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. See? No prayer card, no nothing. Just sitting there praying. And I've seen someone passing out like, now look, there's a younger woman in this woman. I wondered where it was, and I looked, and there it was coming, right across there. And there she is.
Now, do you believe? Who's here? God's word's fulfilled. I have faith in God. Now, little lady, I certainly would not want to stand here as a deceiver. I would want to stand here in some way to try to help you. If the Lord Jesus would let me know what you're here to ask Him, you come to ask Him something. And if you come to ask Him something and He will let me know, then He'll answer back through me. Now, if I said, little lady, you come to ask Jesus something, you're going to receive it and send you on, you'd have a right to doubt that. But when He'll come and tell me something that's been in your life or something back down the road that you know has happened, then you'll know whether that's true or not. Then you'd have faith to know that it was God, that it wasn't Brother Brandon, wouldn't you? You are suffering with a tumor. That's a tumor. And that tumor is in your mouth, on the left-hand side of the jaw. That's thus saith the Spirit. That's right. Our Heavenly Father, laying hands upon the little lady, I ask that the enemy be taken from her and she be made well for God's glory. Amen. Amen. God bless you, lady. Go believing. You believe, lady, with all your heart? Now be real reverend. Real reverend. Keep, keep praying. Now you're doing just wonderful. Set in with God. Just set in with God. Be real quiet. Watch. Of course, if you feel like giving Him praise, certainly do it. God is an object of worship, and God wants to be worshipped. I don't blame you. I worship Him. I scream His praise. It's the top of my voice. But the lady standing here being estranged to me and me not knowing her, but God does and knows all about her. There's someone in here praying, and I can... Oh, it's the lady sitting next to the lady there has arthritis. That's right. You believe that Christ would heal you, lady? If you can believe, you can receive. Amen. What did she touch? You believe now? You have something wrong in the feet. It's an arch is like drop down. And you're here wanting to ask me a question. And that is you're wanting me to pray for somebody else. And that person has something like water in the tissues. It's dropsy. And that person doesn't live here. It's in a high place where there's a lot of wind. It's Lubbock, Texas. That's right. You believe? Go and receive just exactly what you've asked for in Jesus' name. How do you? You believe him? I don't know you, sir. But God does know you. There's something wrong in your bones. Cancer in the bones. That's right. You believe me to be God's prophet or his servant? Amen. Mr. Hatton? Okay. That's your name. Okay. Go home and be well. In Jesus Christ's name. Make your, be made whole. Amen. God bless you. Yes. All right. Believe me. All right. You believe with all your heart? Just a moment. Oh, he's wonderful. What do you think of that heart trouble? you believe God will heal you of it? The man sitting right there? No, the lady with her hands up don't have heart trouble. She has 
Uh, that lady has arthritis, and she wants to be well of it, too. That's right. Is that right? Uh-huh. <laughs> you think that digestion would leave you, too? Believe God would make you well? You believe it, sir? Believe God would heal you, too? Yes, sir. You believe that God would heal you the heart trouble? Lay your hands on each other along there, then. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, that devil has been exposed, and I rebuke it in the name of the Lord Jesus. May it lead. Amen. That's faith. Just set right in with God now. Don't doubt. Believe with all your heart. You got gallbladder trouble there, praying, haven't you, lady sitting right here? Trouble with the liver, gallbladder. Colored lady with your hands up around your face. You believe that Jesus Christ, God's Son, make you well? You believe that God will make you well and heal you? You do? You're so nice to your eyes to get well, too. You believe? You had eye trouble, didn't you? That's right, raise up your hand. You haven't got no glasses, but you had eye trouble. Put your hands on each other. Oh, God, in Jesus Christ's name, I rebuke that enemy. And this church rebukes it, that it'll leave these women and come out of them, and they'll be made well. Amen. You believe? Oh, my. This is it. This is what God wants you to do, is to believe Him. You believe, lady, with all your heart? Oh, all right, have faith in God. You have many things wrong with you. Got a rupture? Stomach trouble, nervousness, something wrong with your hip. That's right. By fall, hurt your hip. You're a missionary. Correct. Missionary to these Indians. Right. You brought this little girl here. You want me to pray for her, for her eyes. That's exactly right. If that's right, raise up your hand. You believe? Our little girl, you believe now with all your heart. Why? All right, you see what's happened to her before you look? She just cross-eyed when she walked up here. Before I've even prayed, her eyes has come straight. There's your eyes. Just perfectly normal. Without even being prayed for. The Holy Spirit's here. Amen. Go on your road rejoicing, and in Jesus' name, may she receive what she's asked. Amen. God bless you. You adopted that child now. Believe now. That's right. You've adopted it. Oh, how wonderful. You believe, lady? I can't heal you, but God can heal TB. Do you believe he can? How do I know who you was or what about you? God knows, doesn't he? Sure, I'd get up and take the old cotton and go home. Believe God be healed. Amen. You believe, lady? Believe God heal that stomach trouble, make you well? You go home and eat what you want to? In the name of Jesus Christ, make you receive the healing. Have faith and believe. Well, the dear lady's making an effort to get up over there. To pray. There she is on her feet. Um, let us say praise the Lord. You believe, my brother, God? In the name of the Lord Jesus, may you receive your healing. Amen. Go thanking God. Little lady, you believe God heal arthritis, make you well? Go off the platform, just rejoicing, and saying praise the Lord. How many of you will believe right now God will heal the whole audience to make you well? God can do all things. Do you believe? Oh, what a wonderful...
wonderful time. Do you realize that how many believe that that's the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ permitting this? Then with one accord, with one great time, the Holy Spirit can make every person here well. you believe it? Let's just lay our hands over on each other and pray this prayer together. All of you with me. That's right. Pray the prayer of faith shall save the sick. God shall raise them up. Oh, the presence of the Holy Spirit confirming the word. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, God, our Father, in Jesus' name, we condemn all sicknesses and all diseases and all powers of the devil, and I rebuke the devil. May he come out of this people just now. Go out from them and never bother them no more. In Jesus Christ's name. That's right. Are you convinced? Look, right now the Holy Spirit's telling me, said, stop right now and make that altar call. Right now is the time. While wow, my spirit is moving. This is Bible days. This is the Holy Spirit beyond any shadow of doubt. I want every person that wants to accept Christ for their Savior to come right down here just a minute. Give this people this opportunity. Will you come? I want to shake your hand and meet you right here. Come on now. Let's walk right down here. The, come right here. Get up by your seat. I want to have a word of prayer with you. Come here. Every sinner that wants to come, move right up here now. That's right. Come right down out of the balcony. Is that right? Come right here, son. God bless you, my boy. I want God to make you every whip what he should be. God bless you, young man. Will you come, sir? That's right. Come right on. Come right down. Now, give him time to come to the balcony. Come right on down here. All right. You want to bring this man up here? All right. Bring him right up. That's good, brother. All right, sir. All right. Come right on down now. That's right. God bless you. I come just as.
That's right, brother. Come right out. Come right out. Someone else come now for the prayer while we're waiting just a moment longer. The Holy Spirit speaking. Look, friends, the very supernatural Christ is right here. Now, do you see what it means to be led of the Spirit? Look at the sinners come pouring around the altar. See, they are conscious. The Holy Spirit's here. They know that. Just the same thing that tells me what's wrong. It spoke to me, said, make that call right now. I have some in here coming. And I stopped right there and did it. See him packing the stretcher away from the lady? Now the very God that you're accepting, the very one that you're believing on, God bless you, young man. Such a wonderful time. Wonderful time. The Holy Spirit moving right in. Would you come right in here, Sister dear? I'd just like to shake your hand as God bless you. While we all stand here for the prayer. God bless you, my dear sister. God bless you, my little sister. May he just ever richly bless you. The little Spanish girls here. God bless you, little sister. And the little ladies there. God be with you, sister dear. Just want to touch your hand as I know it is here. God bless you, sister dear. May he spirit be upon you. Now, isn't it wonderful to know that the Lord Jesus is here? You know what? Way over in the old countries, way down where you don't even know what a newspaper is, the Holy Spirit works the same with them people there, and they have the same action that they do here. Just think that the Jesus Christ, God's Son, the one that's going to take us, to heaven is right here now. That's His Spirit moving to us. You say, Brother Branham, I've never seen anything like that. Well, that's the same thing's working in you. That's the Holy Spirit. These little ladies standing here, and young man, just as a little teenage, in this great reckless time that we're living in, to see Him come weeping, oh, you just don't know what, how that pleases the Holy Spirit. That's wonderful. Now, let us bow our heads just a moment for prayer. Now, do you that's coming here, I want to quote some scripture to you, you little ladies and you elderly people and all together. The Bible said this, you know what you are tonight? You are God's love gift to Christ. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father draws him first. And all that the Father has given me will come to me. Think what you've done tonight. You have passed, by coming here on this to accept Christ, you've passed from death to life. 
Now, if you trust me to be God's servant, if you believe me to be God, that's just what's happened to you. Now, I'm going to quote the Scripture to you. Here's what Jesus said. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall never come to the judgment but done pass from death to life. Think of that. Jesus said that. And look, just think of the little ladies in the city tonight. Think of the elderly man in the city, the middle-aged women and men. Tonight, that doesn't have the opportunity that you've had. God has sent you here, manifested Himself before you, and you, with a broken heart, come around the altar weeping. What are you? You are God, Almighty God. You are His love gift that He has chosen you and given you to Jesus Christ tonight. And Jesus loves you so much that He said, No man can pluck them from my hand. They are mine. I'll raise them up at the last day. God promised you that. Every one of you. You've got life because you're standing right here before this audience as a witness that you believe it and accept it. Now you that's come here tonight, every one of you around the altar, and will believe and will take Jesus as your Savior and believe it is, is in the presence. Now, you trust my words. Trust me, if you can, for discernment. Like the little lady saying there's a female trouble just saying healed. All right. You believe it? Believe that God made you well? If you do, you can. That's right. You can have it. Amen. It's all over, lady. Sitting there praying. It's all finished. Have you got a prayer card? You don't have a prayer card. No, no. You don't need one. See, you're healed anyhow. Amen. See there? Now you know there's something here that tells me that. Is that right? Mark it. See how infallible it is. Now that same Lord Jesus is here to say this. If you will accept Him tonight as your Savior and for, ask, ask Him to forgive all your sins. Now see, you couldn't have come by yourself. Something's happened. You say, Brother Branham, what do I have to do now? Nothing. Just be thankful. See? Look. All the Father has given me will come, and no one can come except my Father draws him first. Now, how many of you here standing here that's repenting, that is willing to say, I am finished with sin, and from this night on, by the grace of God, I'll live for Jesus Christ? Will you raise your hand? You're standing around the altar. I'm finished with sin. I accept Christ as my Savior. God bless you. Wonderful. Now, he that will confess me before man, him will I confess before my Father and the holy angels. Is that word the truth? Then what happened just now? When you made your confession, Christ put your name on the Lamb's book of life. You can't perish, and he'll raise you up at the last day. Now, aren't you happy for that? Now, let's bow our heads and give him thanks and praise him for what he's done for us. Now, all the rest of you Christians, pray for these here. It's just coming to accept Christ. And I believe God will give them the Holy Ghost right here where they're standing. I really believe it, that God will give them the Holy Ghost right here too. All right? Minister, brethren, walk up close now, up here close. We want to see God do a great thing here. Wouldn't you love to have this feeling that all this great Holy Spirit that's here now, that just knows all about you, and is telling you in your heart, Wonderful. Wouldn't you love for him just to make his abode in a great baptism and get, come out of your heart and just make you happy and joyful and, and just give you power to overcome the things of the world? Wouldn't you all like to have that right, right here where you're standing? Each one of you? Would you like to have the Holy Spirit raise up your hands? Each one of you. Right here around this. Right to have. Now he's sure to give it to you. See, you come on confession, you believe Him, you pass from death to life, but now you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit to give you power to overcome and great things to be done. And just watch what happens this week while the revival and next week. Oh, I believe God's going to do wonderful things. Don't you believe it, church? Now let's just walk up and bow our heads down and give God praise. Everywhere now. Our Heavenly Father, with the heart that's just the jerking for joy, with something down in me that's just letting me know that this is just so pleasing to thee, thou hast come down and going right down these lines and up and down these aisles healing the people. And now you've done more than that. 
Thou hast brought people from death unto life. There's been a resurrection. These sinners who were once alienated out in the world without hope, without God, and tonight by the leaving of the Holy Spirit has quickened them. And they've come to life. And they rush to the altar. I've shut their hands and standing them here and quoting to them thy infallible word which heavens and earth will pass away but thy word shall never pass away. And as I look into the face of this young and old and the middle aged little girls and little ladies and little young man and old men and old women as they're standing here, some of them coming down the aisle just shaking with under conviction. Oh, great Holy Spirit, this great, tremendous power of your presence. They've accepted you as their Savior. Now I pray, God, that you'll send down great power from heaven and anchor in their soul the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Grant it, Lord, just now, let something take place. A new child be born, an unction, a power fall upon their hearts just now. And the Holy Ghost set this place to glory and shaking and glorifying and magnifying God. Grant it, Lord. Oh, hear the prayer of your servant. Hear me, Lord, as I pray to thee and grant these blessings. Now keep your hands up in the air. Put your hands up. Praise Him now. Or I will praise Him. Just raise your hands up. Say thank you, Lord. Now that's it. That's it. I will praise Him.